energy is essential for development and sustainable energy is essential for sustainable development team birth good evening ladies and gentlemen thank you for being there to gain knowledge and put into practice this is the eighth webinar towards continuous professional development cpd organized by the commonwealth executive master of business administration public administration semba sempa faculty of management studies open university of sri lanka i am sure you will be enlightened towards sustainable energy therefore i request you to listen mindfully being in the present moment it was in 7th april 2012 we inaugurated the association to gain share knowledge through networking also we conducted an international seminar to coincide our first agm due to the impacts of climate change increasing at a, an alarming rate sustainability has become a necessary action sustainable energy that emphasizes the need for using cleaner and greener energy in the present scenario adapting sustainable energy practices can help us get a step closer to building a renewable future in this way we can solve major energy crises such as oil shortages fuel depletion and many more and save the planet from future crises for generations to come with that note i would like to invite our vibrant energetic and one and only president of semba semba alumni mr indra kalyanage to welcome all of you and highlight the objective of today's webinar over to you indra kal thank you uh, dr dhananjay good evening ladies and gentlemen the chief guest and panelist today professor nali nabesekara dean of the faculty of management studies of open university of sri lanka Mr. Asanka Nanakar, Chief Coordinator of Sempa Sempa Program. Professor Sivalokadasan, former Dean of the Faculty of Management. And the members of the Academia of Management Faculty of Open University. Mr. Nimal Pereira, our distinguished paper presenter today, who is a leading consultant in the field of energy management, climate change, and sustainable energy. Mr. Priya Gunawardena, director at One Europa Devotees, our eminent panelist. Dr. Sridharan, our immediate class president, our vice presidents, Ms. Vindya Jayasen and Dr. Dhananjay Dharmaratna, who is uh, heading the session today, who's chairing the session today. And secretary of the association, Mr. Indika Vijayaratna, and our liaison officer, Mr. Cecil Pereira. Mr. Ajit. De Silva, our executive council member, and our other expo members who are logging today of the alumni. My dear fellow members of Sempa Sempa alumni, invitees, students, and all other participants and guests who are logged in to the session today. On behalf of the alumni, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for today's events and highly appreciate your interest shown to participate to the seminar despite your busy schedules. It is a positive sign to observe that society is getting back to its feet with adhering to the safety guidelines. And it seems like that we have now identified the ways and means of tracking the challenges face due to the pandemic and to overcome the impact. In addition to that, the country went through a, some political and economic crisis recently and power energy uh, issues, which we are getting back to normalcy step by step. Our alumni have been conducting sessions via Zoom and other electronic platforms as CPD development events for its members for some time now. And today's program, would be such an event which we attempt to discuss the most relevant subject matter 
of the energy crisis which is faced by our country. This program was scheduled as a result of the demand by its members to conduct a session on the salient factors affecting the country's economy during the challenging times. Energy crisis being one of the main issues faced by big and small industries alike at present was selected by the organizing committee as a timely topic to discuss given the support extended by many stakeholders in the economy. However, it is also one of the main issues faced by many countries in the world, which has been subject to number of deliberations due to the challenges faced by the community engaged in the activities during the recent past. I think we have selected the most appropriate person to do these presentations today. Thank you very much, Mr. Pereira, for accepting our invitation and doing the deliberations today. Yeah, I hope our audience will have many queries to be made from the eminent panel whom we have invited and would be very uh, uh, thought-provoking session. We as alumni believe that conducting such programs to upbring the knowledge of our members and the society is one and the society is one such giveaway to the country out of the knowledge we have gained while at the university. Actually, our although Mr. Professor Tilakaratna can't be with us today because he is engaged with another activity, he sends his best wishes to the program. And he is also a frequent advisor to our activities. My sincere appreciation also is extended to the organizing committee for the support extended in arranging this program. In addition, we have lined up many such events and CHR projects by the alumni and would like to cordially invite you to keenly participate on those activities. Just to touch upon the, the CSR projects that we have completed recently would be to provide PPP packs for the health workers who were constantly supporting the keep us safe during the last pandemic times. Without further ado, I would like to invite all of you to actively participate in today's event and also take back points discussed to be applied in your organizations, maybe either as an investor or as an employee who will ultimately support the country's overall objectives for the economic development, which we are desperately in need. Have a fruitful evening and stay safe and healthy. Over to you, Dr. Dhananjay. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Lianage. As you correctly said, there is a power shift. So today, today we are talking about power. So before we start the presentation and panel discussion, there are a few housekeeping rules. Please keep your mic on mute mode. The questions will be at the end by using the raise hand option, or you can forward to the chat box. Sustainability is a societal goal that broadly aims for humans to safely coexist on planet Earth over a long time. Sustainability consists of fulfilling the needs of current generations without compromising the needs of future generations, while ensuring balance between economic growth, environmental care, and societal or social well-being. That is the most important. Energy defined in physics, the capacity for doing work, it may exist in potential kinetic, thermal, electrical, chemical, nuclear, or other various forms. There are moreover heat and work, that is energy in the process of transfer from one body to another. And scientists define energy as the ability to do work. Modern civilization is possible because people have learned how to change energy from one form to another and then use it to do work. Sustainable energy is derived from resources that can maintain current operations without jeopardizing the energy needs or climate of future generations. The most popular sources of energy of Sustainable energy, as we all know, including wind, solar, hydropower, are also renewable. 
solving the energy crisis is one of the most essential undertaking of the 21st century. Perfect solutions will be hard to come by due not only to drastic differences in political and public support for sustainable energy throughout the world. But the extensive knowledge required to address the many challenges associated with the global energy landscape is very essential as our president just mentioned. Once again, welcome all of you to SC4 Energy Crisis Free Sri Lanka webinar organized by Semba Semba Alumni. Please help me to introduce and invite our speaker for today's webinar, Mr. Nimal Pereira. Mr. Nimal Pereira is a product of University of Colombo and obtained his first degree in 1983 and later has earned postgraduate qualifications in the in industrial engineering, business and financial administration, pollution control engineering, industrial waste management, and efficient energy use in industry from local and overseas universities and institutions. Mr. Pereira is a chartered envir environmental professional in Sri Lanka, recognized by the Institute of envir Environmental Professionals Sri Lanka. He currently works as a freelance consultant in the field of energy, environment, climate change, and sustainable development. Mr. Pereira is the senior vice president to SCP Forum, Sri Lanka, member of the board of trustees to the Asia Pacific Roundtable on Sustainable Consumption Production, APRSCP and chairperson to the Consumer Consultative Committee, the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka, PUCSL. Some of his professional affiliations include past president, member of the board of directors, and a corporate life member to Sri Lanka Energy Managers Association. Life member to the Sri Lanka Association for Advancement of Science, SLAAS, Institute of Environmental Professionals, Sri Lanka, and GHG Management Institute, United States. Mr. Pereira is an expert trainer and facilitator in the field of energy management, environmental management, sustainability, sustainable development, clean production, green sustainable productivity, sustainable consumption production, SEP climate change, GHG, carbon accounting, etc. Further, he is a visiting lecturer to University of Rona, SLIIT, Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology, National Productivity Secretariat, and National Institute of Labor Studies. He is a member of the National Expert Committees to National Climate Change Mitigation Expert Committee. National Energy Award Evaluation Panel and Presidential Environmental Awards Evaluation Panel Industry Sector. In the field of climate change, Mr. Pereira holds a valid expertise in national GHG inventory development, including Sri Lanka Second National Communication for UNFCCC. Organizational GHG inventory management and reviewing national GHG inventories in the capacity of UNFCC C national roster of expert for national GHG. Mr. Pereira is the convener and co-chair to the Green Hydrogen Working Group of the Sri Lanka Energy Managers Association. Mr. Nimal Pereira has re recognized with a special award, Environmental Achievement Award by United States, Asia Environmental Partnership Program, USA EP in 2006. Mr. Pereira has visited several countries in enriching and disseminating his expertise. Mr. Pereira holds more than 30 years field experience, including 15 years directly attached to manufacturing industries, including total manufacturing facility, installation, commissioning, operation, and management. 
with this note i would like to hand over the proceeding to mr nimal pereira over to you sir you have 40 minutes thank you very much uh, for the uh, uh, very long introduction on me hope you all can hear me yes we yes, hear you yes sir we can hear you okay, great loud and clear first of all thank you very much for semba and senpa for uh, giving me the opportunity to share my experience and uh, our knowledge related to the subject area and uh, first of all se4 energy crisis free sri lanka se4 sometimes you may be think that what is it is it regarding any other lubricant oil like sea 40 no this is basically i'm going to uh, you know discuss about sustainable energy for energy crisis for stand for sustainable energy for energy crisis free sri lanka um, Having said that, I think basically about uh, the energy. There is a bit of uh, you know explanation about the definition about the uh, energy, the capacity to do work, such as capacity to move an object. That is on to the physical physics uh, basic basics. and uh, for the most important thing is almost everything on earth in the universe are energy that's basically how i define even our bodies are consist of purely with energy because you know, the body if you break into small small pieces i ultimately end up with atoms atoms in further you break into small pieces end up with energy but still i don't know or somebody knows about where is the end, starting point or the end, end part of the energy i'm very happy to learn that but still i am uh, very inquired for that subject this is basically the biophotosynthesis when you are talking about the energy we should not forget about the carbon dioxide and water and light energy combining in our green cell green for leaves inside the uh, with the help of uh, the chlorophyll it's combining and developing chemical substance like glucose the glucose carbon hydrogen and carbon carbon chemical bonds containing the energy absorbed from the sun and finally those uh, sub, those uh, monomer sub, the molecules like uh, glucose are further converting into starch or maybe cellulose or lignocellulose or whatever the stuff and then finally we are ex we are extracting those things maybe in a form of harvest in our paddy cultivation and uh, boil it and eat it and then again uh, and the inside the body is converting back to glucose and the glucose is again further taken into the body cells and then breaking down into carbon dioxide and water and carbon dioxide when it break down the carbon da, carbon carbon molecule the the, uh, the bonds in between carbon carbon atoms and carbon hydrogen bonds again we are accepting into the body which is the originally we it is extracted from the sun so therefore it's very worth and reasonable to say i am talking in front of you with the photo the to the power of in a sun so if the sun was not there definitely i could talk i can't uh, open my eyes i can't move my uh, laptop uh, the the cursor what oh, everything is all totally depends on the sunlight or the solar energy so we have to have a very great respect to our the sun which is our uh, the ultimate source of energy supply Uh, one or a kind of resource, but several years back, maybe millions and billions years back, some of the uh, cellulose and the lignitic material has been thrown into the deeper layers of the earth and undergone through a heavy pressure and heat. 
and for long time period and converted to coal, lignite and peat. And today we are extracting those coal and lignite and burning and in the same fashion, we are producing the thermal energy, the thermal energy used for various purposes like power generation and so on. But the question is, we don't know why this uh, carbon sources, carbon containing cellulose or the, the natural sources were being sent to the uh, deeper layers of the earth. It's the nature. The nature has decided to send those uh, carbon containing molecules or the, the materials to the deeper layers of the earth as a kind of uh, action to keep the carbon locked inside the body and uh, inside the deeper layers of the earth. Maybe because to balance the temperature is up to a very healthy temperature like 26, 25 degrees Celsius. But today we are extracting this carbon containing material and burning and releasing these carbon molecules or atoms back to the atmosphere, making the total earth warming back to the original position again, I suppose. So having said that, there are different types of different classes of energy sources like primary energy, secondary energy, uh, and service energy, and so on. That's based on the naturally available and de derived types. But most importantly, we have to consider about, we have to put our eyes on the, based on the length of the life cycle and the environmental impact, or the ecological sustainability of these sources. Basically, I'm talking about renewable energies and non-renewable energies. Some of the examples for uh, renewable energies, solar, wind, geothermal, dendro, thermal, etc. And then non-renewable sources like fossil fuel, forest, biomass, nuclear, etc. At this point, I have to make a, a kind of a, a reminder basically some people they are defining nuclear is also as a renewable energy but it's not a renewable energy but it's a climate friendly energy because it never emits carbon dioxide so therefore it's a climate friendly energy but it's not a renewable energy because the life cycle of nuclear reaction is very long so therefore you cannot classify it as a uh, renewable energy this is basically always a kind of a illustration or illustration I use to give the uh, difference in between the renewable and non-renewable sources of energy. In the top uh, left uh, right hand side diagram, you can see a conventional way of flowing the paddy field with a uh, pair of buffalo. Uh, how these live machines are fed up with basically with the grass. The grass contains cellulose and cellulose is absorbed through their bodies and break down, break down, break down into, again, glucose. And the glucose is taken as a source of energy through so their bodies. And the carbon dioxide is emitted back to the environment. And then within a couple of weeks time, the same carbon dioxide will be absorbed by the uh, the grass community and then the grass population will absorb this and then again that will keep on circulating with this the same cycle. But you, if you think about the, put your attention to the, the bottom left hand side diagram, the picture which I have taken from Alawa areas within a couple of you know, difference of couple of minutes period. Uh, you can see a hand tractor developed by our uh, one of our chief scientists. He named this one as an iron bull, but uh, the thing is, it doesn't pass how done. So that's the main difference between the, uh, the buffaloes and this one. Uh, we have to fed this uh, machine with uh, feed this machine with uh, fossil fuel, maybe diesel or gasoline, or maybe kerosene, mainly the diesel. When you feed this machine with diesel, 
from where we absorb, uh, absorb this uh, energy source is basically from a very deeper layers of the earth. And then we are refining this crude oil which we have uh, extracted from the ground and then converting to diesel. Diesel is combusted inside the combustion chamber and part of the sun is used as a source of energy to drive the machine and part is again emitted to the environment in the form of carbon dioxide and because of the partial combustion it emits carbon, carbon particulates as well which again makes a very detrimental impact to the uh, humans as well as the other living creatures. Carbon dust and carbon dioxide are the major main impact. So if these carbon dust and the carbon dioxide again to be converted to the fossil original fuel, fossil fuel, I'm sure that will take another billions and billions of years. But of course, you can think about uh, the different technologies today we are de developing, like the carbon capture and carbon uh, dust capturing and storing technologies would be able to produce another way of diesel or a kind of a fuel, but it's a very expensive and energy intense. So therefore, it's very reasonable to say this one is operating with a non-sustainable way of or non-renewable non source of energy, which is unsustainable. And then somebody might ask me a question. So if that means we have to always depend on the buffaloes. Yes. We are respecting buffaloes because of certain reasons. But again, uh, my point is we are working with the science. We are working with the science technology. So it's the high time to develop biofuels and feed this particular equipment, particular iron bull, and make use of the this uh, natural or renewable sources of energies to drive this particular machine or maybe uh, another source like hydrogen, which I will discuss at the end of my presentation. Why this energy crisis? It's high impact source. It's a high, high import source dependency, lack of purchasing power, global high price, high demand, global, globally as well as nationally, less supply and competition and scarcity, poor natural, <laughs> national planning for energy, lack of national sustainable energy planning, and also there may be several other reasons which I don't want to uh, explain and explain in front of you, but you all are very well aware about it. So this is basically our how our energy, uh, conventional, uh, the uh, human economic development model behaves, but it needs the conventional economic development model start up with the needs and the consumption, which stimulate the demands for goods and services. And producers, they produce all the products and services and offering to the demanders or the consumers through the trading process. And when the demand highs and when the consumption highs and when our lifestyle goes up and the production goes up, we always uh, claim that the national economy is booming up and we are happy. We are earning more and more dollars. We are earning more and more rupees and cents capacities. So therefore we claim that we are economically developed. But the issue is from where the supply of resources to cater this economic development. It's basically from not only one mother. And also after consuming all these resources, we are again throwing back all the, uh, the waste material back to our mother. So the mother is getting sick. My special attention to this particular model everywhere, all the places, even to do the extraction of natural resources, even to dispose the natural resources with the waste what we are generating. All these cases we have to use energy. So they are both energy is vital in this conventional economic development model. But only thing is the source where we are getting this energy. So that's my main question. The sustainability impact behind the conventional energy. 
is basically air pollution, water pollution, solid waste. So as we are very well aware about this pollution, so these are basically some of the basic impact of the, uh, the conventional use of energy. So the only solution as we uh, initially already uh, mentioned and indicated, the basic uh, answer for this energy crisis is sustainable energy, which addresses the triple bottom lines of the sustainability, that is to support the economy, to cater the needs of the society within the environmental limits which we are living. So I have here added the fourth dimension to the sustainability framework. That is none of the other thing as basically nature. So all our economic development, social behaviors and environmental activities have to be in power with the nature. Don't ask me a question how to define the nature. So that is again uh, something which I, which I am trying, still trying to make a kind of a definition. But environment is very easily we can define, which is something around us. Basically, the living and non-living and human and the interaction between energy. So that is basically environment. So that we can very easily manipulate, we can manage. So that's why we are talking about the use of 14,000, 14,001 energy management system sorry, environmental management system. We can manage the environment through the environmental management system, a defined system, but we cannot make any uh, system to develop nature management system. Nature has its own way of managing the whole universe. So that's something I have already understood at my uh, this age. The issue what we are facing and what we have to face today is basically the decoupling energy and economic development challenges. Always higher the, as you have already observed in my the conventional model, always what we are expecting is with the economic growth, we are expecting high global energy use and then the environmental impact especially having a focus on the climate change impact, the environmental impact is keep on increasing. But here, what I have shown is, what I am depicting is basically a, depict, uh, a decoupled way of global energy use and economic growth from the environmental impact. So for that one, we have to have a changes in our energy supply technologies and also always changes in energy supply and demand consumption patterns. So that is a must. Especially with the global energy use, our lifestyle will just keep on increasing. It's uh, coming to a very <coughs> sophisticated way of li living style. But there we have to have a very good high concern about the changes in energy supply and demand as well as especially the consumption pattern. The consumption pattern has to be very highly focused rather than the uh, supply technologies and supply side. The sustainable energy is the way that the energy supply and demand, again the same definition I have derived from the ACP for the sustainable consumption and production, Sustainable energy is the way that energy supplied and demanded so that meets the needs of the person without compromising the needs of the future generation. At an affordable cost, so with a social comfortability and low ecological impact and best resource conservation basically leads to sustainable energy. The global energy scenarios. So this is uh, just uh, depict the increasing intensities of the energy use in the world throughout the world. This is a global, this is uh, the information I have extracted from the uh, world energy statistics. So you can see by 2018, 
81% of the, the total global energy supplies through non-renewable sources like coal, oil, and natural gas. And very tiny amount of energy is supplied through, supplied through other sources like uh, wind, biomass, waste, and hydroelectricity and nuclear fuel. And then the world electricity generation by source, 64% with fossil thermal energy. The rest is from nuclear, hydro, and other renewable sources by 2018. But it's something uh, nice to see. I'm happy to see something, a, a tiny change. Electricity generation by source from change, there is a significant change from 1973 to 2018. You can see the oil sources which were in use in 1973 nearly about 24.8%, is being changed to 2.9%. But to complete that gap, the natural gas from 12.1% is being shifted to 23.1%. One of the reasons why the natural gas is being used, it is cheaper by source, and also the high in combustion rate, and also if it get, that will give you a high combustion rate, and also it's a fast reacting source of energy rather than oil or coal. And also it's a clean source of uh, energy compared to the coal and oil. Because coal and oil, they are containing sulfur, but the sulfur content in sulfur, natural gas is very minimal or even negligible. So therefore the sulfur dioxide emission which leads to sulfur dioxide, the, the sulfur dioxide pollution or the something called uh, acid rain is avoided with the switch with this type of switching. And also natural gas is having a lot of other uh, industrial uses like nitro nitrogen fertilizer production and so on. In the meantime, there is a shift uh, from 3.3% in nuclear energy use in seven, 1973 to 10.2 percent, beside considering the uh, safety risk of this natural nuclear source. And also hydro, you can see it has been reduced from 20.9 to 15.8 and so on. But still, there is a good sign. Non-hydro renewables like uh, and waste from 0.6 percent increase to 8.9, sorry, 9.8 percent. So that gives you a kind of an indication that globe is globally, there is a trend is moving towards uh, the renewable energies. But because of the oil price surges after the Russia attack in Ukraine, so you can see these are according to Bloomberg sources. From June 2020 to uh, December, the closer to this one, the, closer, the December part will be basically that will be a prediction, projection part. But there is a serious increase in price increasing in the uh, oil prices as well as the natural gases. Again, there is a kind of these are kind of a statistics energy supply sector, the role of the renewables, estimated renewable share, the total. Final energy consumption, you can see 79%, 89, almost about 80% of the global energy requirement is per, uh, performed, supplied through uh, fossil fuels. The rest is nuclear, traditional biomass, and 11% is renewable. So that's a good, fairly reasonable sign of moving towards renewable energy in the uh, global scenario. And again, uh, according to the RIN 28 renewable energy uh, 2021 report, uh, you can see the 70, the, uh, the fossil fuel contribution is reduced to 72.7%. Uh, this is basically for the 
global electricity generation. And the global electricity generation related renewable energy, again, there is a substantial increase. How is the national energy flow? This is based on the, uh, the energy balance diagram obtained from the Sri Lanka Sustainable Energy Authority. 2019 figures. So you can see the, uh, the top one is uh, the orange color one is basically uh, shows the, the fossil fuel or the finished petroleum products. Nearly about uh, 242.9 light. And then you have coal and you have crude oil, you have elect, uh, the, the, uh, the hydropower and also biomass. So you can see there is a substantial input from the biomass, traditional biomass, as well as from the imported sources of non-renewable sources. But if you go to the, the right-hand side of the diagram, you can see the demand side. Uh, this is uh, shown in Pika Jewels. Uh, the foreign bunkers and aviation are basically caters to the, uh, the marine and uh, air aviation, the air, source, air transport system. Industry, nearly about 111.7 uh, picajoules. And then domestic and commercial sector, 144.6. And transport sector is having a, having a substantial volume of energy use in our energy balance. So if I pick this, I'll show this one in a, a pie diagram. So you can see biomass, solar, hydro, wind accounted for about 37%. And then again, crude oil and crude, sorry, coal, crude oil, and petroleum refined sources accounted for about 63%. That is the input side. And the national energy use, again, foreign bank percent 10%, industry about 25%, transport sector 32%, and domestic and commercial sector nearly about 33%. I'm sure now you can understand why we had a uh, energy crisis in Sri Lanka. Because transport sector almost totally depends on the imported fossil fuels, except a couple of uh, few numbers of vehicle operating on electric mode. And uh, the industry major part is again, depends on the imported sources. Domestic and commercial sources, especially the, the cooking, uh, domestic cooking uh, systems have been already changed to LPG. What is the sustainable energy, of, what are the energy sustainable energy options? Number one, the first step approach should be energy efficiency, not the renewable energy. Because always our business word is always, if you ask for any, any organization or any uh, individual or a domestic uh, head, what is the, you know, what is the best way to go for uh, renewable energy or the energy, energy management? Immediately the answer is, why don't you go for solar power? Why don't you go for a rooftop-based solar power system? That shouldn't be. Always, first you have to address the energy efficiency. Otherwise, what would happen is, you are planning your rooftop solar for to way, part of the way, part of the plan is for your wasted energy. Because, now let's say, if you are domestic or the uh, industry power consumption is let's say 100 units and if it has a maybe about 20 percent inefficiency so then if you plan for 100 units of power for your operation it means you are planning for the inefficiency as well you are wasting energy for inefficiency as well so therefore First, you have to put your focus on the energy efficiency. That should be the first step. And then, 
according to uh, some of the estimates we made uh, in the past nearly around 1895 gigawatts hours of energy is wasted because of the inefficiency so what do you mean by the energy efficiency change in the way of use of energy and transforming many markets through appliances and systems and then the next option would be to go for renewable energy something like maybe solar or wind in a mass mode so these are some of the options which you can think of but still you all have a challenge a lot of challenges technically financially but still there are options for us to uh, get into these renewable sources which we will come into this one at the later stage of my presentation one of the road map for uh, for best way of sustainability of sustainable energy is our national energy policy whether it has been done or not whether it has been implemented or not we have a very nice uh, in a national energy policy introduced in 2019 the national energy policy and strategies of sri lanka aims to ensure energy security through supplies that are cleaner secure economical and reliable to provide convenient affordable new energy services to support the socially equitable development of sri lanka so that's the basic definition given in uh, national energy policy according to the slsc words there yeah. i have a very uh, interesting term something called energy trial in maybe some people this is a new word for them but this is basically is the situation in which a difficult choices has to be made between three alternatives especially when these are equally undesirable the most important word is these when these are equally undesirable so how to get the best option this is it basically to address the energy security energy sustainability and energy equity so what are the what are the pillars of this particular options energy security providing energy services at at the optimum cost to the national economy it's up to you all to decide whether it is happening currently or not that is the second question which we have to address this and improving the energy efficiency and the conver, conver, con, conservation that basically talks about the energy conservation and energy efficiency in a enhancing the self reliance are we self reliance with the energy providing opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurship again it's a big question that's why i say do it is not practiced but it's in the book it's in the guideline it's in the policy the energy sustainability caring for the environment but still major part of our energy use through non renewable energy sources like petroleum enhancing the share of renewable energy but of course there are a lot of planning side available a lot of such changes a lot of changes are in the pipeline strengthening the good governance in the energy sector i don't want to give much more uh, you know explanation about the good governance here because as you all are well known about it the energy equity assuring energy security still it's a problem again providing access to energy services again it's a problem securing land for future energy infrastructure is partially happening something but these are the best kind of uh, uh, 10 pillars if you are really interested to go for sustainable energy in sri lanka some of the because energy trilemma is a basically it's a indicator 
So these are some of the examples. If you take the countries like uh, Switzerland, which uh, goes to the rank one of this, uh, the, the, according to the 2019 statistics, it has a score of 85.8. It's in the category of AAA. If you take the USA, the rank is about 15. It's in the rank of AAB, where the energy security is well performed, energy equity is well performed, but there is a lack of environmental sustainability because they are operating with coal and nuclear. What about Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka is somewhere in our rank 85. We are at the rate of BCC, but environmental sustainability fairly reasonable. Uh, again, uh, energy security at that time, there was a certain level of stability, but to take the energy equity, it has a question mark. That's why it has gone to the rank of 85. Don't misunderstand me because this is basically the data relevant to based on the 2019, not 2022. If it is, if it comes to 2022, I'm sure we are at the very lowest level. But the global stock, still we are living under the, under the sun. The sun is giving nearly about 3,850,000 exajoules per year. The yellow box shows that. The pink box is nearly about solar energy for evaporation of water, that is from the main water bodies in the world. The solar energy and wind, uh, you know, represent this green color box. So still there is a valid amount of energy, reasonable, substantial amount of energy, which we can tap through the, which we are directly receiving from the sun. So therefore, rather than digging the earth, it's the high time to look on the sky and to get more and more renewables, renewable energies from the sun. But this having a lot of challenges. We will discuss about it later. This is the local stock of renewables. You can see solar, wind, and hydro. It has a very high rich situation. Again, biomass. I'm talking about the not, I'm not talking about the, the natural biomass, but the grown biomass. We have a lot of opportunities to go for biomass, growing biomass for energy purposes. The best sustainable option, what would be, as I mentioned earlier, the number one should be energy efficiency. Then renewables like solar, wind, grown biomass and dendro, and hydro, of course, it has to be added to this list. But there are a lot of challenges. Number one challenge, the hydropower, actually, we have the major hydros and the, most of the, uh, you know, the mini hydros and the, the small hydros, the capacities have all be, already been exhausted. So we have to, and also we should not forget about the hydro, when we are talking about the hydrogen, the hydro has to be shared with the agricultural sector and the domestic water supply sector as well. So therefore, the first priority has to be given to irrigation sector and then to the water for drinking purposes. And finally, the third option is only the third rank is the only one we are giving to power generation. Because the most important sector in the out of these three are uh, the irrigation for food supply, food production, national food production, and the water for drinking purposes. So there you will have a challenge. So therefore stored energy with hydro will have a, again a challenge. And again, though we are enriching these uh, hydro reservoirs up to the full level after the heavy rains, Within a couple of weeks' time, it goes to a, it drops down to somewhere around 10%, 20% capacity, mainly because of the 
heavy wind and the warm wind because that evaporates a substantial amount of water from the water bodies because our, all our water reservoirs are having high mouth high capacity or the high area mouth and a very shallow uh, volume that is one reason and the other what are the other challenges especially if you consider the solar and wind intermittencies because they are not continuous within a short period sun can cover with the cloud and maybe the rainy time the intermittent intermittency is a severe problem so therefore the storage of the sun is a very challenging issue but still i am proposing the best sustainable formula as energy efficiency plus other areas like solar wind hydro biomass natural gas biogas and also hydrogen though hydrogen is not a source of energy but i am not going to introduce hydrogen as a source of energy hydrogen will be a vector or a kind of a carrier of energy from one place to the other place let's discuss about it later options which we have to practice in sri lanka how many containers we are flying around the, the uh, in our normal routes but still you can see these are developed countries this is one of the developed country how they are tra transporting containers through the railway still we have number of fuel storage depots throughout the country like places like badulla Peradeniya, Purunagala, Radhapura. The, the foreigners, the Sudha fellows, they have developed all these fuel depots in different locations. Even still, we have the capacity to increase the number of fuel storage capacity and do the transport through the railway. But still, what we are doing is we are transporting through roadway. When recently, I think a couple of days back, I had a travel visit to Trincomalee area. I just made, made a count for a one day, for a one day light. I saw, I observed nearly about 50 containers in the roadside. So if you convert this one into the railway and get the final end, end distribution from the using this road mode, how much of a benefit which we could have obtained and entertained. This video clip is from India. Just entertain, just have enjoyed. I'm sure that you all have already counted the number of wagons transporting with loaded lorries. This is India's Roro Railway. 
if you all are interested, just visit to uh, do a Google search and ask for row row railway. Row row means roll on rolls. The lorries are lorry lorry tires are rolling on railway rolls. So that's the meaning. How energy efficient and what sort of energy and time saving and safety, road time saving, everything is yeah, from, from by together. And again, the global and uh, local initiatives towards greening the industry. The top right, uh, left hand side picture German steel industry transition to transi transistor to uh, wind and hydrogen. So one of the steel industry, those are actually high, steel industry is a very high intensive energy, energy intensive industry. This has been transferred to wind energy, renewable energy. So it's very interesting. It is not only the uh, wind energy, and all, but it's to including hydrogen as well. When you talk about the hydrogen, it's not the brown hydrogen or gray hydrogen which produced out of coal or maybe like natural gas it's basically uh, produced out of solar energy with the water electrolysis something called green hydrogen and also the top right hand diagram it talks about a story from tokyo cement a tokyo cement uh, plant it's a, basically it's not a full full scale operation of cement plant. It's only the clinker operation, the clinker grinding, and uh, the bagging operation, but uses substantial amount of energy. It's been totally converted to renewable energy through biomass. But they have a system to obtain biomass, mainly rice paddy husk and sawdust and the clericidia. How they obtain this? The empty lorries coming to get the cement loads, they are coming up with uh, this material, renewable energy material. And they are returning back with the cement load. And in addition to the cement plant operation, they have already established another uh, dendro power plant, that is basically very CDR based power plant in uh, Mahayangana and a capacity of eight megawatts, fully functional and successfully operating with a lot of sustainable benefits to the community. And the bottom center diagram is basically the mass fabric park, MS fabric park, biomass based district heating system. What is this district heating system? They use biomass mainly waste biomass for the generation of steam and the steam is produced at a central location and distributed throughout the industrial park through the piping system this is basically called district heating system and the interesting point of this one is all the condensate generated after the steam is converting to water is again returned the hot water is returning back to the boiler again through the similar set of pipeline this is the first ever district heating system established in the country. It is not only for heating purposes, there are op op options available even to go for district cooling system. Generate chill water at central location and distribute it among different places. Just think about a good infrastructure if you can plan for Colombo City, how worthwhile it is. Let's enjoy uh, again a video, short video clip from Toyota, uh, sorry, uh, Tokyo Cement. Indian Sagare Mutu Ate Ibiruta Variela, Abaki Sutra Matru Bumia, Loki Nitsit Paragani, Neil Harita Behind Pirutur Watulu, Ranvan Berlatirian Sah, Asam Sama Jaiva Vivida Tani Savini. So, having a sound the rain, Paripur and Vima to hit one Nasima. Some castle is with this in Sakrival in Batapu, Pedima, Goliosh, Nathia, Ilia, and decided to go to Pratipa, 
ನೆಗೆನಿಹಿರ ವಿರಲತೀರೆ ಕ್ರಿಯಾತ್ಮಕ ಅಡುಗಾನ ಪ್ರತಿಸ್ಥಾಪನೆ ನಡೆಸಿದ ಅರಣ್ಯ ಮಿನ್ ಪ್ರಧಾನ ಜನಾಖ್ಯೆ ಮೆಹದಿ ನಾವಿಕ ಹಮುದಾವೇ ಸಹಯೋಗೇದ ಅತಿವ ಇಹಲ ಜೈವ ವಿದ್ಯಾತ್ಮಕ ವೇದ ತತ್ಕಮಾಗ್ಯತೆ ನಮೋದ್ ದಡಿವ ವಂದವಿ ಮೇ ತರ್ಜನೆ ಕಡಮೋಹನ ಪಾತಿವೇನ ಅಡುಗಾನ ಶಾಖ ನವದ ರೋಪಣೆ ಕಿರಿ ಮಸಿದ ಕಿರಿ ಶ್ರೀಲಂಕಾ ನಾವಿಕ ಹಮುದಾವ ಕೊರಲ್ ಸಂರಕ್ಷಣೆ ಎಲ್ ಮಕ್ತಾತ್ವೇನ ತವ ಸಂವಿಧಾನ ಕೇಪ್ಯಾಕ್ ಸಮಗ ಅತ್ತೆಲ್ ವೇದಗಾತ್ ಟೋಕಿಯೋ ಸಿಮೆಂಟಿ ಸಮಾಗಮ ತಮ ಸಭೆಯು ಕ್ರಿಯಾವಲಿಯತಿ ಅಪತೆಯನ ಕಾಂಕ್ರೀಟ್ ಪ್ರತಿಚಕ್ರೀಕರಣ ಕರ ಸಾಧನ ಬ್ರೀಫ್ ಬೋಲ್ ವಿವೂಹ್ಯಾನ್ ನೆಗಡಿಯರ ವಿರಲ ಆಶ್ರಿತ ಮುಹುದು ಪತುಲೆ ಕೊರಲ್ ವರ್ಧನೆ ಉಪಸ್ಥರಲಿ ಸತ್ಯ ಪರುಗರಾಯಿ ಅನಾಗತೆ ಅಪದೇಶಿ ಬಾರಕನ್ನ ದೂದರುವಂಟ ಆಶ್ವಾಸ ಕಿರಿಮಟ ಪಿರಿಸುದು ವಾಪುದಂ ಸಹ ತುರುಲತಾವಿನ್ ಪಿರಿ ಸ್ವಭಾವ ಸೌಂದರ್ಯ ಇತುರು ಕಿರಿಮಟ ಗನ್ನ ಉ ಉತ್ಸಾಹೇ ಕೊಟಸ್ಕರು ಹುವೀಮ ಮೇ ಸೀಲು ಪರಿಶ್ರಮೆ ಅಂಗೆ ಅಪಟ ಲಭೆನ ಉಪರಿಮ ವಟಿನ ಕಮಾಯಿ ಶ್ರೀಲಂಕಾವೇ ಸಂವರ್ಧನ ಕ್ರಿಯಾವಳಿ ನಾಯಕತ್ವ ಸ್ಥಿರ ಸಾರಲಿಸ ಅನಾಗತೆ ದಿಗ್ಲಬಾದಿ ಮಠ ಟೋಕಿಯೋ ಸಿಮೆಂಟಿ ಸಮೂಹ ಮೆಸೆ ಪುರಂದುವ ನಾಥಡ ಪಾರಸರಿಕ ಸಂರಕ್ಷಣೆಯ ಪುದೆಸಾ ಕೆಪವೀಮೆ ಅಪಗೆ ದೇಶಯ ಅನಾಗತೆ ಒಬ್ಬರ ನಗಾಸಿಡುವೀಮ ಅಪಗೆ ಏಕಾಯನ ಅರಮುಖಾಯಿ ಅಪ ಸುವಿಶಾಲ ಸಮುದ್ರಕ ಇಕ್ಕ ಕೂಡ ದಿಯಬಿಂದು ಅಪ್ಪಮನ ವಿಹಕ ಪುನರ್ಜನನೀಯ ಬಲಶಕ್ತಿ ಉತ್ಪಾದನ ವರ್ಷಣಕಾವೇ ಶ್ರೀಲಾಂಕಿಕ ಅನನ್ಯತಾವೇ ಸಲಕುಲಾಯಿ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅನದರ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಸಕ್ಸಸ್ ಸ್ಟೋರಿ ಆಫ್ ಬಯೋಮ್ಯಾಸ್ ಎನರ್ಜಿ ಇನ್ ಶ್ರೀಲಂಕ ಬಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ರೋಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಹೈಡ್ರೋಜನ್ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಎನರ್ಜಿ ವೆಕ್ಟರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿ ಎನರ್ಜಿ ಕ್ಯಾಪಸಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಹೈಡ್ರೋಜನ್ so you can see when you when i compare the methane methanol petrol or gasoline diesel or even firewood or even coal the what is the best calorific value is none other than hydrogen it has a cap- high calorific value of 120 to 142 mega per kilogram you can see all the others except uranium this reference only to the uranium So the only problem is whether we have hydrogen naturally available in our surroundings no we don't have it. so we have to produce hydrogen currently the hydrogen is being produced with different technologies like steam reformation of natural gas so that's the basic uh, or the most prominent process they are accepting uh, the most of the developed countries like norway and uh, some of the european countries they are uh, <coughs> receiving heavy volume large volumes of higher natural gas from the uh, these uh, russian russian territory and they subject this particular natural gas to steam reformation process and they produce hydrogen this hydrogen is used as a source of energy or a kind of a vector of energy in the meantime they use this hydrogen for the fertilizer production of basically nitrogen fertilizer production through the power wash process process so that's why we have a severe problem in front of us because there could be a very serious fertilizer shortage especially nitrogen fertilizer shortage in the future if you have already predicted this the reason behind it the ni- the supply of uh, natural gas from uh, the natural gas supply from uh, Uh, Russia to the uh, European territories have been already stopped. With that, there is a definite shortage of uh, urea or nitrogen fertilizers in the world because one third of the urea supply to the world is coming from Norway, a company called Yara. Yara is having a severe problem of hydrogen these days. But on the hand, they are currently also they are receiving certain amount of natural gases that is something else but one of the green light what we can see in front of us is during the last cop 26 conference of parties 26 at the climate change conference the severe kind of a very serious uh, threshold has been given to all the developed countries to develop for the production of green hydrogen using solar and wind power to generate green hydrogen and use green hydrogen as a source of energy 
or a vector of energy as well as for the purpose of industrial application. So, this is how the hydrogen is working. A dream of a cleaner, healthier planet. Technology that brings man, nature, and the automobile together as one. Hyundai Motor Company, leading the way to a cleaner global environment, strives to begin a new chapter in automobile history, dreaming of the fresh, green future of mankind. by the electrochemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen within the fuel cells. There are also zero emission vehicles, their only byproducts being water. The technology of such perfect clean cars lies in fuel cells. time constraint I stopped this one this really particular video but I had the opportunity to travel. Sorry to disturb you uh, sir we have taken about 55 minutes sir. Okay then I did the last, last couple of slides. Can I continue? Yes sir please please go ahead sir. Right. I just want to remind the time. In addition to the, uh, the, the mass transport with the bus uh, even now the railway is being already developed, operated with hydrogen. This is basically called developed by the Alstom. The train is called uh, Foradia Island. There are four trains are operating throughout in Germany and France, which is totally operated in uh, hydrogen. Okay, ultimate goal is the energy crisis for Sri Lanka with minimum risk and high energy trilemma in there. How to do it? Increase the capacities of renewable energy absorption to the national grid at the maximum level. And when there is a, when there is a overflowing energy electric, the electricity, to use this electricity for the purpose of hydrolyzing and collecting hydrogen and then use this nitrogen for industrial purposes as well as for energy conversion purposes to make the grid enriched with high capacities of renewable energy. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nimal Pereira. Uh, it was very thought provoking as well as there was a lot of information which most of us didn't know. So once again, on behalf of the association, thank you. And uh, today we have a panel discussion with two prominent individuals. One is our very own Professor Nalin Abesekara, who is our pillar or strength behind our association, who is the Dean of Faculty of Management Studies and Mr. Priya Gunawadana. So I will just uh, run through Professor Nalin, uh, your brief CV. He's an alumnus of Ananda Vidyale. His first degree was a special honors degree in marketing.
from the University of Sri Javadanapura. After that, along with his Master of Business Administration degree from the University of Colombo, he, he has won three gold medals in the field of strategic management, marketing management, thesis. Also, he completed his PhD in leadership and marketing from the University of Colombo in 2013. So I can go on his CV. But due to time pressure, uh, I invite Professor Nalin uh, for a few words before we move on to Mr. Priya Gunwadana. Uh, thank you very much for the briefing. And I think I should thank uh, Mr. Nimal Pereira for enlightening us on uh, something on this sustainable energy. Because you know, like by, by looking at the energy crisis in the world and by looking at the energy crisis in, in Sri Lanka, we are most of the time we always try to concentrate this energy into the fuel crisis. But if you're really looking at the set and the subsets, we have to be very concerned about this uh, particular energy crisis in the world. In uh, 2022, August 3rd, one of the very interesting uh, news appeared in. Uh, uncard.org website where they say energy crisis, UN global crisis response group urge support to most vulnerable and transition to renewables. In that particular article, they say uh, as the war in Ukraine continues to rage, so the energy prices are like compounding. But anyway, despite this alarming situation, major oil and gas company recently report record profit. So according to the Secretary General, the combined profit of the largest energy companies in the first quarter of this year are close to 100 billion US dollars. So we are the Secretary General of the United Nations. He urged governments to tax this excessive profit and use the fund to support. Because I, I just want to mention this. Basically, by looking at the energy crisis, as uh, Mr. Nimal mentioned, there can be localized shortages. Then the, the war. Now we can see the war between Ukraine and Russia and the market manipulation. But in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, by looking at the context of this country, so we, are, we don't have a long-term focus. But anyway, we should have always talking about the sustainable development goals. In the su sustainable development goals, we have been given 17 sustainable development goals. By year 2030, we have to achieve. We are number seven, goal number seven, discuss about affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. So we are, they are looking at the in, ensure universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy, increases sustainability, the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix, and double the go, global rate for improvement in energy efficiency. So we need to achieve this 2030 sustainable uh, development goals, I think in Sri Lankan context. So by looking at the SDG 7, so we are we are talking about certain aspects we need to take into consideration. But uh, due to the time restrictions, I might tell you, even though we are talking about this crisis situation, there are certain companies, they are very much earning profit. But again, we need to understand by looking at these three pillars, profit, then again, uh, the, we are talking about one of the most important three Ps, people, profit, and the planet. Unfortunately, this planet with the sustainability factor is totally ignored by the people of this world. And in Sri Lankan context, we can see the same. So that is the, that the particular thing we can observe. But I am not an expert of this subject. But I think uh, we have been already enlightened by Mr. Nimal. And I think I would like to see more information and more insight from our other panelists, Mr. Priya Gunavardhana. Also, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. He is our professor and dean of faculty of management studies, Professor Nalin Abesekara. Now, I would like to uh, read out a very, very short uh, profile of uh, Priya Gunawardena. Mr. Priya Gunawardena is a founder, director of One Open Devotees, a non-profit organization dedicated for forest restoration and sustainable agriculture. Mr. Gunawardana commenced his career in 1985 as a forest ranger in the forest department. And after serving 14 years in the public sector, he joined the private sector in 1999, 
as a senior manager of Finlay's tea estate, Sri Lanka, a subsidiary of James Finlay Company UK, that manages Hapuga Senna and Udupusala Plantation PLCs, and retired in 2021 as direct operation. He has gained his global experience and exposure to business management, contemporary agriculture forestry, and environmental conservation by attending short courses and workshops in many countries. Mr. Gunwadhan has contributed to many national committees, including developing Sri Lanka standards, specifications, and criteria an indicator for sustainable sustainably produced full food food the national action plan the list goes on so with that note uh, mr gunwadana uh, by going through your profile i would like to open up the questions and uh, my question would be uh, since you have worked so long in your life in this area how does forestry and plantation sector, sectors can contribute to sustainable energy? So with the introduction, you can start, uh, Mr. Gunwadana. It is over to you. Thank you so much, Jit. <clears throat> and it's a pleasure actually to participate this event. And thank you very much for the invitation too. And yes, there's a time constraint. I believe that you can hear me. Yes, we hear you. Sir. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Thank you. And actually, my experiences on sustainable energy goes with plantation sector mainly. Since I was worked with the forest department at the plantation establishment and supply of biomass for energy is uh, one of my subject. So uh, having... Uh, I talk about these things actually i would like to highlight that in agriculture sector tea plantations are doing a vital role so generally in total uh, exports it's about 11 percent contributed by the tea plantation so tea plantations and the tea production the highly use the biomass energy now recently we had an opportunity to do a study on biomass energy that used for tea industry because uh, we were assigned to conduct a study and develop a roadmap to ensure sustainable fuel wood supply for tea industry in Sri Lanka. We are doing this for the Minister of Plantation Industry. Actually, currently we are working on uh, that project. Mr. Nimal Pereira, Mr. Yajin Tisilwa and many other uh, consultants are working with us uh, to develop this roadmap. <coughs> During this study for the roadmap, actually we came across a very interesting figures from the plantation sector. The plantation sector at the moment in tea industry, uh, they have a demand of 545,000 metric tons of fuel per year. This is a very big demand comparing to the industrial demand in Sri Lanka. It's about 10% uh, of the total demand of industry biomass requirement. But however, plantation sector can contribute to this sustainable energy as Mr. Nimal Pera correctly said that improving the efficiency and converting into a sustainable uh, fuel root sub, uh, biomass. Especially we are looking at certain areas. Uh, for example, as I told earlier, that uh, there is a demand of 545,000 metric tons per year for tea industry to manufacture tea. And it is, in other words, we need about 1,651,000 cubic meters of fiber per year to produce, say, around 300 million kilograms of tea. So, how this firewood or energy supply or biomass? come to the tea industry. That is one area we are looking at. During our study, we observed that there are about 8% uh, of the fuel wood supplies are from the own known sources that handled by the 
the estates and other uh, people involved in the tea industry. And mainly the 92% of the fuel wood supply are from external supplies, in which actually many of the supplies uh, come as mixed firewood, which of which the origin is unknown. So that's a kind of critical factor in the industry about the sustainable energy. And at the moment, we are looking at finding ways to reduce these unknown sources and to make sure that sustainable fuel would supply. So that in that case, actually, the industry can contribute a lot because as, as uh, Mr. Limalpera explained earlier, industry sector and the household and commercial sector are highly using biomass energy as their energy sources. If you look at the petroleum use and the electricity use, generally the petroleum usage is mainly with the transport. But industry sector, as well as the uh, uh, household sector, they are mainly use uh, biomass energy as their source of energy. And now the demand is increasing in the industrial sector also. Because at the moment, we, we, we saw a minute ago, we saw that Tokyo Cement is establishing uh, biomass energy uh, plants. I mean, the biomass uh, the dendrothermal energy plants. And then again, they were talking about at the end of their video clip, they were talking about uh, the challenges, how the unplanned thermal bio biothermal energy plants can affect to their supply lines. Likewise, in Sri Lanka, there are many other industries now going into uh, use of biomass for their energy purposes. And there's an there's increase in shortage in fuel load in uh, so many other industries. Likewise, you know that uh, in garment sector, there may be leaders in garment sector participating in this uh, webinar. But I see that in garment sector and the fabric sector in BUI zones like Biagama, they are also converting their energy source into biomass energy. Now, this has created another challenge to the tea sector. Actually, tea is uh, some kind of uh, uh, contributor to the foreign exchange in Sri Lanka. But unfortunately, in certain areas, some tea factories are facing kind of difficulties to get bio. Uh, biomass, I mean, fire, uh, fuel wood for their manufacturing purposes. So, Mr. Nimal Perran, Mr. Ajit Sitra, and myself, we are planning to visit down south uh, tomorrow. Actually, they are facing a real situation of a scarcity of fuel wood at the moment. So, this is how the tea industry is facing mm -hmm. the issues with uh, sustainable biomass at the moment. But tea industry and the forestry, they can contribute a lot to increase this biomass. The plantation sector, I mean the uh, corporate sector, they have the huge land mass in plantations under uh, regional plantation companies. Actually, they can increase the planting of this biomass in their land, as well as the forest department at the moment, they have about 80,000 hectares of uh, forest plantations. And recently, they also decided to increase the uh, biomass production uh, with dedicated uh, forest plantation. So that's how I believe that the challenges in the plantation sector, tea sector, as well as how they can contribute it. Dr. Dhananji, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gunawadana. And also I would like to, on behalf of the association, uh, welcome, I saw you, Professor uh, Sivaloga Dasan, who was the former Dean of Faculty of Management Studies. Thank you, sir for being here with us. And I would like to open the forum for any questions. Uh, we, we can take about another 10 minutes, uh, President. There are any questions? There are two questions. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, we'll take another 10 minutes. And there were two questions from the chat box. Before I go into chat box, if any of you wants to have a question to the panel or the presenter. Mr. Yajit, uh, you, uh, you can ask the question. You can unmute and ask the question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. 
The concern is uh, this actually I, what I want to share with uh, all our professors in the university. The energy crisis is one of the biggest crises because you see even in the household and everywhere people are not really aware how to utilize energy effectively. The message, as I said to all uh, academics, whether they could take forward this message and you required uh, publicity to their respective connections and uh, organizations to address this very important issue. Otherwise, it's going to be a major issue in time to come. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ajit. Not only you asked the question, but you are the one who proposed these two gentlemen to us. And Ms. Chamail Edri Muni, uh, you can unmute and ask the question. Yes, thank you for uh, giving me the chance. Actually, uh, uh, Mr. Nival Pereira raised uh, a, a valid question uh, regarding, uh, regarding our biomass uh, industry. So that uh, uh, how, uh, what is the percentage that we are going to use uh, in the biomass, uh, as the biomass uh, for the energy sector? Actually, uh, now we have about 45% of our total energy consumption it is by biomass and uh, we, oh, we, yes. we we had uh, some um, uh, issues with uh, gas supply and then we had to move to bio uh, biomass uh, uh, for for the for cooking and all these purposes actually it is well written in 2019 uh, energy policy because it is uh, as i can remember it is 3.4 I think uh, we are lacking uh, this part. I don't know from the government or some government sectors or, or some agencies. I think we should uh, be uh, moving to uh, this biomass for the, uh, not, not actually, we can have dendro power plants as well, but, but it, would, it would not serve the purpose. But, uh, but I think we should move to more biomass for cooking because it is uh, about 45% of the total of uh, energy use, actually uh, electricity only accounts for 13%. So uh, Mr. Imal Silla also had to actually uh, survey out. Uh, this is not uh, actually relating to the uh, electricity sector. Most people think that, uh, so coal is being used and then oil is being used. Actually, even 50% of renewable is being used uh, to produce electricity, but, the total of the uh, energy uh, consumption, it is 13% uh, like less amount uh, we are using from electricity. Actually, uh, I just want to have this query and to forward this clarification uh, more uh, uh, into the future because uh, uh, we need to move to the biomass for cooking and other purpose. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nimal Perra, I think it's uh, uh, more of a statement than a question. Anyway, thank you very much, Mr. Chamil, for enlightening us. Uh, uh, I have a very basic question uh, from uh, Mr. Can, Nimal. Uh, yes. There are a couple of words related to this, this uh, particular question. Basically, uh, the application of uh, biomass for the domestic cooking purposes is well accepted. But the only problem is this is having a lot of uh, uh, indoor air pollution issues. Unless otherwise, if you go for a uh, very high efficient cooking and the fuel mode uh, with a very small particle size, uh, there will be a lot of indoor air pollution issues. So, and also, the because of the lifestyle today, the people are living with, especially in the domain, the what you call the uh, flats or the uh, uh, high-rise buildings and compart uh, apartments, uh, definitely you will have problems in use of this one and the disposal of uh, the ash. So that basically gives a kind of an impact to the this particular issue. But of course, still uh, most of the uh, the domestic uh, cooking purposes in the rural areas they are using still using uh, biomass. So that's why, especially. You know, energy balance, the major part is uh, towards the biomass. So that's one of the reasons. 
but of course uh, when it comes to the hydrogen energy and biomass and the mixture of the, uh, the natural gas there will be a different formula coming to the scene so that's why and also the formula which i have all, which i have already displayed is not going to be a, a, a static formula based on the national you know capacities time to time it has to be shifted up and down and changed to be different capacities so that's how the, the kind of uh, pro promotion the kind of uh, the, the formula we are going to promote thank you yeah thank you very much uh, mr pereira mr gunwadana uh, you have you can speak mm -hmm. yes <laughs> sorry and uh, mr chamer's uh, question and the statement Actually, I think uh, he's talking about the 2019 uh, energy balance statement issued by the Sustainable Energy Authority. Yeah, it's true that if you look at the, I mean, I invite uh, the participants to whatever the sector they are working, just to just to check this energy balance statement of 19, uh, 2019, uh, which published by the uh, Sustainable Energy Authority. Actually, in that uh, energy balance statement, it says that the biomass demand for 2019 was 165 petajoules. So forget about the forget about the units, but comparatively, the petroleum is 174. In industrial demand, biomass demand is 83 petajoules, whereas the petroleum is 9.3, and electricity is just 70. So the biomass is playing a vast role in the industries as well as the household sector. The household sector, the biomass demand is about 82.7 petajoules in 19, uh, 2019. So uh, looking at those figures, someone may wonder, like Mr. Chamin, you know that why we are not talking much about this biomass and why we are talking about petroleum and electricity. So we are talking about sustainable electricity, solar power, wind power, this and that. But nobody is talking much about the biomass production and biomass efficient biomass usage. For example, in tea industry, still we are using firewood logs, which is not a very efficient way to use. And uh, if they convert that into firewood chips, the efficiency will go up and the moisture content will lower very fastly and uh, very fast and then uh, the calorific value will be higher than the normal firewood logs. So those kind of things actually why we are not promoting. So that's the question. So if you go through the energy balance report, I think the 60, 70 percent of these things, or more than 80 percent talking about the petroleum and the electricity and other things. There are only two statements about biomass energy. But in the same statement, it says that in certain industries and other areas, you know, that the biomass energy is the highest usage in the uh, energy sector. So that's that's there, uh, Shamil, I think uh, I invite everybody to just, if you have time, just uh, check this, uh, look at this Energy Balance 2019 report, which is available on right uh, currently. So then you will be able to get an idea about how the Sri Lanka is working on these sustainable energy things. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Priya uh, Gunawadhan. I think we have, uh, now it's almost nine o'clock, uh, but I, I, I take this pleasure of asking one question from the panel. Uh, that is, it, this came to me uh, when I was going through the uh, subject. Renewable energy and sustainable energy are often used interchangeably, even among industry experts and veterans. There is some overlap between the two as many sustainable energy sources are also renewable. However, these two, uh, two terms are not exactly the same. Uh, a, a very short clarification from Mr. Nimal Pereira or Mr. Priya Gunawadana or our professor Nalina Besekare. Uh, giving a brief answer to this particular question, uh, all sustainable energies are not renewable energies. Sometimes it's vice versa. 
and the issue is actually the renewable energy is mainly addressed about the, the life cycle of the uh, fuel sources or the energy sources and uh, their environmental impact. But sustainable energy talks about the, uh, the three, especially addressing the main three pillars of the, uh, the sustainable sustainability, that is social, economical, and uh, environmental benefit. Now, if you go to the, uh, this, uh, if you can remember the, uh, the video clip uh, on the, uh, uh, by the uh, Tokyo Cement, that addresses the sustainable energy. Because they are giving a benefit to the society. They are giving an environmental carbon sequestration value, that is to the environment. And also they are giving, uh, giving a kind of a, uh, economic, uh, addressing the economic uh, platform or the economic bottom lines as well. So therefore, it gives a kind of a well-balanced structure to the uh, sustainability. It's not addressing only the one factor. So sustainable energy talks about the, this is the three major bottom lines of the uh, sustainability. But again, the renewable energy, we are mainly talking about the environmental impact related energy sources. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nimal Perra. I think we have come to almost the end of the uh, today's seminar. So before we wind up, I would like to invite Mr. Indika Vijayaratna, who is our general secretary and who has been behind doing everything behind the screen, arranging the Zoom links and everything. So with that note, I, on behalf of the association, I would like to invite Mr. Indika Vijayaratna to propose the vote of thanks. Over to you, Indika. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dananjay. Very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the word of thanks at this important event to all dignitaries assembly. It is fair to conclude that the webinar was a great success. Number of people have contributed in so many ways to turn this event into a successful webinar. I would like to express my sincere gratitude on behalf of Semba Sempa Alumni Association to all the speakers for kindly donating their time to share their valuable experience with us all today. Also would like to express my sincere thanks to Mr. Nimal Pereira for giving excellent coverage on the subject matters of sustainable energy and extending his fine cooperation to make this event uh, fruitful. Sir, you truly made this evening meaningful to all who participated at this important webinar. Your deep and intellectual way of imparting knowledge is very inspiration and made this meaningful. Next, I would like to convey my deep sense of appreciation, Professor Nalin Nabe Segara, Dean, Faculty of Management Studies, Open University of Sri Lanka. And he is the one of advisor of Semba Sempa Alumni Association, as he volunteered to share his knowledge on the subject matter. Your input also very useful and made this evening more intellectual. Thank you, sir. We should appreciate Mr. Priya Gunavardhana, founder, director of a non-profit organization, namely Vanaropa Devotees, for playing the role of panel member and sharing his valuable knowledge and opinions today. Thank you very much, sir. A very special note of thanks, Professor Siva Logadasan, for former Dean, Faculty of Management Studies, OUSL for his advice and encouragement. Next, my thanks goes to Mr. Asanka Senevratna, the course coordinator, Semba Sempa program for supporting the webinar in many direct and indirect ways. I would like to thank all the staff members, the Open University of Sri Lanka, 
it is the time to thank our Semba Semba Alumni Association Executive Committee for the untiring effort in making his event a success. Thank you wholeheartedly. Once again, I would like to convey our grateful thanks and appreciation to our resource personnel. On this webinar, we thank you for reserving this evening for us, and it is great pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, I would like to convey my heartiest thanking for all of the participants for your active participation. This effect would not be success if you all are not there. Therefore, big thanks for all of the participants. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Indika Vijay Ratna. So with that uh, vote of thanks, until we meet again as President said with another webinar like this, wish you all the very best. Stay safe and please look after the environment. Thank you and good night.